Whilst howler monkeys are naturally present in the region, they now have to live alongside coddled peccaries. Victims of intensive poaching for their meat, the coddled peccaries have found an ideal home in the hills of Ebera. Local legend says that the monkeys only howl when a witch is around. A little further on, many different animals live in the grasslands of Abera, the most spectacular of which is probably the rhea. These members of the ostrich family like to come and feed in the open areas because they particularly love the young grass shoots. But when you look closely, they're not the only ones feeding on the plants. Strange tracks on the ground lead to a small mound of earth. It's an anthill of leafcutter ants. have developed the characteristic of cutting leaves and blades of grass which they chew in order to cultivate a fungus which they feed on. These huge colonies can contain up to 8 million individuals and spread over more than 600 square meters. They don't go unnoticed, especially by an animal which is particularly partial to these small insects. The giant anteater feeds mainly on ants and termites. It finds them using its sense of smell, which is 40 times more sensitive than that of humans, compensating for its poor eyesight. Once it has found a nest, the animal sheds tears to soften the earth and digs with its strong front claws. To satisfy its appetite, it needs to consume the equivalent of 30,000 insects per day, which it collects using its long, sticky tongue. Between 2000 and 2010, the total population shrank by 30% in Argentina and they'd become extinct in the region of Corrientes. It's not by chance that anteaters can now be found in Ibera. Thanks to an ambitious reintroduction program, the CLT has been able to start to build a small population of giant anteaters. Hector Ortiz is one of the people monitoring them on the ground. Since 2013, I've worked with the CLT. Back then, I started in the Jaguar Reintroduction Center, and then I did lots of things, maintenance, etc. And last year, I joined the species reintroduction team. I look after two groups of collared peccaries, and we're now starting to work with a giant anteater. He's getting closer, closer and closer. He's really close. We can tell by the sound. I love this work. You have to be able to build a close relationship with the animal or else the work won't be done correctly. How do you do that with a giant anteater? These anteaters have been rescued from elsewhere in Argentina. When this one, Arturo, came from Formosa, he weighed 1.3 kilos. Here in Corriente capital, we have a quarantine center where the rescued animals stay. Alicia Delgado and another assistant to look after them. They bring them up like babies. 
because they are babies. When they're judged as being ready to release, they move to a semi-free enclosure where they stay for a month to get used to their new environment. And then they're released fully. Once they're free, we follow them for two weeks and we give them some liquid food every day. That way we can know where they're developing and where their territory is. The return of the anteater is one additional element in the rich ecosystems of Ibera. The spectacular return of wildlife has also changed the life of the local inhabitants. Before it became a conservation area, Ibero was a region inhabited by ranchers. Omar Rojas is one of them. Born and bred in the wetlands, this Corentino knows these waters better than anyone. I'm always proud to say that I'm from the Iberia Esteros because my parents are from here. I'm proud to have been brought up by a man like my father. He couldn't read, but he was intelligent. My father was a small cattle rancher with his own herd. Given our knowledge, ranching still has a future here especially since it does no harm to the wild animals. And they've always lived alongside the herds. I have to admit that we who were born here have lost part of our authentic way of life on our farms. We've been heavily impacted by the climate problems, which continuously bring us a lot of water. And that's why I opted to go into tourism, because I realised that with all this water, it was easier than to keep on ranching. Omar Rojas has always lived in these wetlands, and he's seen a lot of changes happen in the region. When I got married, I went to work on a ranch called San Alonso, here in the Ibera wetlands. I stayed there for 17 years. Around 1998, my employers put their ranch up for sale. And that was when that incredible North American man arrived, uh, Douglas Tompkins. We learnt a lot with him. He's very well respected here. Now before, Ibera was a refuge for hunters and poachers. They hunted and sold game products as well as eating the meat to subsist. Since the poaching has stopped and species protection is controlled by park rangers, we've been able to observe that the number of animals has increased. And thanks to our work, we can now start to show what the Ibera wetlands really are. Besides his work as a rancher, Omar has taken advantage of the opportunities offered by the creation of the park and the return of the wildlife. By agreement with the rangers, he now offers excursions by boat and on horseback to discover the wetlands. Tourism is coming in gradually, and today we can say that it's working, and even working well. I try to teach people all that I know. And at the same time, I learn from people from elsewhere. Tourism is very important. It's very important to meet people from other backgrounds. And each new encounter is rich. It's an exchange. For me, tourism isn't really work. That's why I do it. It's fun. I enjoy myself, I meet interesting people, nice people, 
encontrar con gente muy buena. Eh, mi recomendación sería. My advice is to keep hope and to gamble a bit more on tourism, because in addition to all this, our villages are rich in culture and history. But above all, we have this, Ibera. Visitors have indeed many things to discover in Ibera. One of them is an iconic animal of the area, and thousands of them live along the banks. Weighing on average 50 kilograms, the capybara, known as the capincho here, is the largest rodent in the world. Thanks to its partially webbed feet and its sensory organs on the top of its head, this social mammal is perfectly adapted to a semi-aquatic life. They often cover long distances underwater, walking along the bed, and then return to the surface to breathe. As large herbivores, they have a direct impact on the ecosystems. They maintain the vegetation and fertilize the water and the ground with their excrement. They also act as vantage points for many birds, which take advantage of them for hunting aquatic insects, tadpoles and small fish. The Capincho bases its survival on strong social cohesion. It's not unusual in a family group for all the youngsters of various ages to be in the charge of one adult, male or female. This nursery arrangement allows the parents to go about their occupations without too much danger for their offspring. It's also acceptable for a lactating female to suckle all the young from the same group. is dominated by a male, which marks its territory using a gland on its snout, rubbing it in strategic places. The territory is fiercely defended in violent fights, which sometimes result in serious injury. the disappearance of large predators has led to a demographic explosion in the Carpincho population. They enjoy a peaceful life safe from any danger for the time being.